Hi everyone, this is Kurt with Hypnodyne and today we're going to take a look at how to determine the sleep onset and its mirror counterpart, the time of awakening. If you've watched the previous two lessons, which you should, because we're going to look at the spectrogram, um, and the spectrogram is explained in great detail uh, in the past two lessons, but if you've watched the previous two lessons, you should be able to find out on this spectrogram here at the top, where the sleep spindles occur and where alpha activity might occur. So I will give you a few seconds to try and do that and you can stop the recording if you want to um, take a stab at it. Okay, so the answer is that spindles begin here and end here and this is the first cycle of sleep and alpha activity begins right here and ends right here. Now this is an interesting variation of alpha activity. We went into uh, different alpha phenotypes in the previous lesson, lesson two, and you can see that, that this uh, person has, it's, it's very hard to see because there's not much separation between the two, but there are actually two different alpha ridges right here. But on top of that, this person also has very strong theta waves uh, during wake. Thetas would be the other frequency right here. So this person actually has a triple uh, wave activity during wake. Interesting phenotype. Um, as I've explained in the previous recording, there's always a tiny gap between when alpha ends and, between, and, and when sleep spindles begin, and the gap would be here. I, I'm trying not to put the cursor right there so that you can actually see the gap, it's right there above my pointer. Now because I know that now this is what the alpha activity looks like, I can also go to the end of the recording and see if it reoccurs, and in fact it does, it begins again right here. Now note that interestingly there's a gap here between the alpha and spindles, but no gap at the end. Uh, the patient goes directly from uh, having spindles to having alpha, and that's because as you're falling asleep, there's a stage called N1, where you're slowly, very gradually descending into sleep, whereas at the end, there's probably an arousal, and the arousal is awakening the person, and then they're awake, so there's no gap with no activity. But anyway, let's look into the, at the beginning uh, section of the signal, I'm able to see what alpha looks like, and then I see the exact same pattern uh, in the end. So I can say with certainty that alpha activity at the beginning of the recording ends right about here. And this gap is N1 sleep. So what I do is uh, push the W key to indicate wake, find that gap on the spectrogram, I'm not even looking at the signal at all, and then do a small bit of N2, which is going to be the first period of uh, slow wave sleep, which we're not getting into in this video. We're just looking at the sleep onset. But the sleep onset is when wake ends, and that would be right here at epoch 59. At the time of the recording is 12.09 p.m. And the time of awakening is going to be right here, when alpha waves begin uh, again, and they're very persistent, and they last until the end of the recording. Now, Zmax also shows you this uh, yellow line, which indicates the amount of light in the room. It's not always going to be the case, it depends on what the patient does, but in this case they did turn on the light, right about here, and I suppose they were reading after that. You can see from eye movements and a bunch of movements, they're probably doing something on the bed. And uh, so yeah, all of this at the end of the recording is wake. So the patient was asleep, until epoch 870. Uh, it's important to know the sleep onset and the time of awakening because as you're in bed asleep with your eyes closed you might not be completely aware but you might still be awake in which case you might think that that's time you spent sleeping whereas in reality you haven't. Or for example if you're awakened during an N1 phase right here you might say I wasn't sleeping because you don't feel like you, you were sleeping if you uh, wake up during N1, and yet you were. Now, in most cases, N1 is a very tiny gap in between the alpha activity and the spindle activity, uh, but there might be segments within the recording where 
and one reoccurs. And it's just a period of sleep in which sleep is extremely light and there's not much to go with as far as scoring any other kind of stage. And there are periods like that in people's sleep. So the onset again is here at epoch 59. Now some people also like to talk about the N2 onset or slow wave sleep onset, which is when slow wave sleep actually begins. That would be at epoch 62. That's important too, because suppose that you had begun to sleep right here, but then your spindles had begun right here. You know, that would be, what, like half an hour of, uh, or more of uh, N1, and so your slow wave sleep activity would be considerably reduced. But this is a, this is a very easy episode because we can really just look at the spectrogram and score those. But let's look in detail at the activity. How about we go through the epochs and we justify uh, what we've just done looking only at the spectrogram. Look at the signal as well. well. This green garbage right here is movement. So the person here is clearly moving. Uh, you might be interested in recognizing theta activity. It looks different from spindles because look how big the waves are. I'm going to show you some spindles just as a reference and then we're going to go back to epoch 8. But if we move over here, you see that the zigzag pattern is much faster. You could say here it looks like barbed wire, whereas going back to epoch 8, it's more like triangles. And, uh, you know, this is what's producing this ridge right here the lowest frequency ridge. As I was saying before, this person has a strange configuration of waves as they're falling asleep. They don't not only have two frequencies of alpha, but, uh, but they also have this very intense theta activity. That's what's producing that. And you might also, if you want to go into more detail, notice that this kind of activity, like triangle type, is a bit different from this one. This seems faster. This almost seems like spindles. And to be honest with you, you wouldn't be able to tell by looking at this, whether that's spindle or whether that's alpha activity. That's why the spectrogram is so useful. Because, you know, you can, you can see, first of all, that the alpha frequency and the spindle frequency are very near. So that would be very tough to distinguish the exact frequency by looking at the zigzag activity on the actual signal. On the spectrogram, you see that in the aggregate, so it forms a well-defined ridge around a certain frequency. And also, there's overlap. So, this person's alpha does indeed occur at the same exact frequency as the sleep spindles. You might also remember that before, or in the, in the previous lesson, uh, I talked a bit about how sleep spindles are brief bursts, which is indeed the case here. See, they last a second, second, sometimes two seconds, but not more. Whereas alpha activity goes on for longer. We can find a place where that's strong. Perhaps we can see that. Okay, see all this barbed wire type activity it goes on and on and on and on. That's how you can tell the difference. Uh, actually, here you can mostly see theta. Here you can mostly see theta. And see, that's uh, the difficulty if you don't look at the spectrogram, that you can only see a type of activity when that activity is so much stronger than everything else that it emerges as the only thing that's going on. If you take places that are kind of chaotic and you wouldn't really be able to tell, like say here, that's because they're both superimposed. See, there's a bit of this barbed wire from alpha and there's a bit of this theta and they're superimposed. So it doesn't look like anything specific. So you, you can only see something that you can immediately recognize like theta, like this guy here, when that's really the strongest thing that's going on. On the spectrogram, they're all superimposed and they do form a ridge as time goes on. So, for some purposes, especially to get an overview of sleep, the spectrogram is much, much uh, more useful. Let's go back to epoch 8. So now we know that we have our alpha here, and we know that it's not spindle because we've taken a look at the spectrogram. We know that we've got theta. We've associated that with the lowest ridge up here. Move on. Uh, we, you might be wondering what these are. I'm going to bet that they're eye movements, except they're up-down eye movements. Not nearly as easy to recognize as left-right eye movements. 
because the uh, left right eye movements are anti-correlated let's see if we can find some here I'm moving to a period where I'm likely to find REM sleep let's see these are what left right eye movements look like the signals keep crossing each other and uh, they create these kind of bubbles let's say but when the eye movements are going up to down they're much more difficult to interpret uh, you can do it sometimes like here sometimes it's just not going to be possible and that's not a big deal because most eye movements especially during REM are left to right here we see another huge movement and when there's a movement you just shouldn't believe anything that's going on upstairs because the EEG signal here in blue is very very much distorted and uh, full of noise when there are major movements so we ignore that here we've got some left and right eye movements look at these um, anti-correlated uh, like flips of the signal up to down down to up and the person is still moving so you know a sleep technician observing no accelerometer usually they don't use this line of data they just use the EEG but they usually have many more derivations or leads or channels instead of having two like this and they would just look at what's going on here and they would see that there's movement just because the signal is going crazy but you know having the accelerometric data is more reliable because you can actually see movement as opposed to the effect of movement on the EEG anyway as you move forward you continue to see alpha activity and movements so you know if you didn't have a spectrogram uh, you would still totally be able to see what's going on alpha activity and movement so that must be wake here we have a little bit of uh, what are called slow rolling eye movements but just a little bit and then alpha begins again and these are micro details that you don't really need uh, most of the time but they're interesting to note because you wouldn't be able to see that on the spectrogram no I lie actually you would be able to see it let me show you how you see that so basically what's happening here is that the brain is going into N1 sleep these slow rolling eye movements they look like eye movements but they don't have any sharp peak so they're just kind of rolling and rolling these things are occurring in N1 sleep and you would expect N1 sleep to begin at some point because we're in uh, wake and we're getting to sleep uh, and here you can see them they occupy just a little portion of this epoch and I almost thought these are not going to be visible in the spectrogram however if I remove the cursor you can see a very small gap here in the production of alpha activity can you see that like a vertical gap so actually alpha activity becomes weaker and weaker here but then what happens oh there's a movement so instead of going into slow wave sleep there's a movement so you know we can't go we got to stay into wake and uh, and go on with wake if the person didn't have that arousal that small movement uh, spindles might have started just around here instead we went back to producing alpha waves and we've got a movement there movement movement and more movement more alpha is a movement so this chunk these 60 epochs they all look very much the same just movement and alpha activity very very easy to score as wake especially since it's uh, occurring at the beginning of the recording so that's exactly what you would expect and then we go into N1 sleep so you should be observing rolling eye movements like here very weak these things can be much bigger in some people but um, here you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell that there are any and there, uh, here we're already in N2 sleep so in this case uh, this person has only two places that I can find where there are rolling eye movements here and inside this gap that we were looking at before which is here oh, that was a good click <laughs> very accurate here a little bit too so some people have huge rolling eye movements they go like wow wow like that and some people don't have them much and who knows what's that caused by different people you know different phenotypes that's again I have to say it every time that's why yeah sleep scoring systems that assume that everybody's the same are very very naive but it doesn't matter because we know that that's n1 because uh, alpha activity has ceased completely and spindle 7 begun yet so that's n1 for sure so I guess the last point here would be how do we know when spindles or n2 sleep begins because we looked at the onset we looked at 
and N1, and then we need to know when to stop scoring N1, right? So I've done it looking at the spectrogram. I haven't looked below, so let's look below. I see spindles, one, two. So this is an epoch of N2 sleep. The one prior to that didn't really have any. So the spectrogram way of scoring this was completely accurate. There was not even a need to look at the signal. Uh, if you want to, of course, go through the epochs, you can get a little bit more detail. Like there might be some confusion. Do you start, like for example here, I, I think I overdid it because we're not in wake yet. Let's see, where is the first epoch of wake? I would say it's here because that's a major, it's not a major body movement according to the definition, but it looks major to me. No, nope. that's not where alphas begin. Alphas begin. Ah, not so clear to see here because we also have a lot of uh, EMG activity. These things here, they look even more spiky than barbed wire. That's probably from EMG activity. I can't really see much. Okay, yeah, so I see alpha here. I see alpha here. These are a little bit of slow rolling eye movements. But, you know, if I look at the spectrogram, I still see alpha activity even before that. So I'm going to score alpha. Sorry, I'm going to score wake starting from here. And this is the, the good part of the spectrogram is that there might be some activity that's not necessarily much stronger than anything else that might be going on and so you don't see it right here. Like with these spikes you're not seeing alpha. You might be seeing perhaps a little bit more on the light blue channel. But I know from the spectrogram that we have alpha here beyond the shadow of a doubt so I can begin scoring alpha. So in this case looking at the signal has just confused me more and my initial estimation using the spectrogram was correct. So just for consistency, since we've done it uh, for this beginning period, uh, let's look at all this uh, big chunk of that I've scored as wake and make sure that it's really wake. So we've got a lot of alpha activity here, see like kind of like a barbed wire, but it's the whole epoch. Here we've got some rolling eye movements. But see, there's still alpha, so it's not N1. Like you, it's totally possible towards the end of the night that you might wake up, go back into N1 sleep, and then wake up again, or wake up going to N1 sleep, then have a little bit more slow wave sleep. And uh, I guess the person is really relaxed at this point, so these slow rolling eye movements are coming back, but the alpha is not going away. So eventually the brain decides, nah, we're done. And does more movements. And so on and so forth. So, the, perhaps the best time to talk about movements is, uh, is in this video, since it's uh, relatively still short compared to others. Uh, let's throw in the scoring of body movements. So you might move a lot throughout the night. And you know from the previous lessons that if you look at the spectrogram, these vertical lines like this one, like this one, like this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, these are all arousals. It's when you move around and uh, the effect of that movement on the uh, EEG channels is to introduce uh, broad frequency uh, contamination, which is shown here as a vertical line. All right. So what do you want to do with these arousals? Do you want to capture them and show them on the hypnogram, which is what we're building here, this uh, blocky kind of chart that's called the hypnogram? Do you want to capture it or not? Because according to the AASM rules, which are the ones that uh, real sleep technicians follow, not every body movement gets scored as wake. Whereas I have the habit of scoring all of them as wake. So let's, let's think about it for a while. So my purpose, when I look at my hypno hypnogram in the morning, one of the things that I want to see is how many times I was moving around. So, suppose for a second, just to simplify that this is all N2 sleep and, and N3 doesn't exist. Let's suppose it for a second. And I just want to score slow wave sleep and then when I'm moving around, I want to score wake. These vertical spikes that get created by me doing that are very telling. They contain a lot of information. Now that's not the same way that sleep technicians are used to scoring sleep. For sleep technician, there are some specific rules 
uh, before you can go ahead and score wake. Uh, for instance, you must have alpha waves. If you don't see any alpha waves, uh, you don't score wake. So this would be would stay N2. And these two probably would stay N2. Now, a hypnogram is just a tool, right? So I guess whether you want to show arousals as wake depends on what you want to do with the information. Uh, one thing to be said is that this program outputs a report in which uh, body movements are shown separately. They are on a separate chart. And you can check that on the website, there's a sample report. So theoretically you don't really need to put every body movement and reflect it in some way on the hypnogram. Perhaps the best way is to just follow uh, the AASM rules. On the other hand, it's handy to just look at the hypnogram and see how many times you were moving around. So what does AASM actually say about movements? Well, it says that first of all, there are arousals and there are major body movements. Arousals can be a change in EEG activity, which is going to be really tough to tell, let me tell you. Like a shift in EEG, it's, it's shifting all the time. It's got to be really dramatic. I think the type of shift in EEG activity that you can easily observe is when the spindles are gone. But we're already doing that with the spectrogram, so we're not really concerned with that that much. Uh, arousals can also easily be scored if you have body movement. So the difference between an arousal and a major body movement is that the major body movement needs to occupy at least half of this epoch. That's completely arbitrary. You know, it doesn't really make any sense to me why you would want to go with that. It's just for consistency among scorers. That's why these rules were invented mostly for, its con for consistency. So that you can compare one study to the other and reduce the effects of people having different ideas as to what constitutes what. All right. So if you go with that definition, the AASM definition, most of these vertical things are not really going to be scored as wake. You're going to need to have two things. You will need to have a major body movement first, so at least half of the epoch being pure movement. In fact, it doesn't even say movement because you don't really use accelerometers in sleep studies, you use the EEG. So the way that they phrase it is that at least half of the epoch needs to be so disturbed by movement that you can't tell what's going on in the EEG. So for example, here there's movement. I guess the period of me not being able to tell what's going on, it would be here. Here I can see some delta waves. So this would not be a major body movement. So you, you would have very few body movements. And then the other difficulty why I don't like this method is that you need to see alpha waves. Now we've gone over this epoch here, right? And you've seen how often, even though you know from the spectrogram that it's all alpha waves, you've seen that, practically speaking, you're not always be able to see them on the signal. Because for you to see them on the signal, as I've said, they need to be the strongest thing that's going on, period, like here. You can see them here. You can't really see them here. This is all mixed activity. And, you know, when you have these brief arousals throughout the night, even if you woke up, uh, generally, the uh, alpha wave activity doesn't last very long. And so most times you're, you're not actually going to be able to see it. So if you go with the uh, AASM method, you're going to probably underestimate uh, periods of wake. And it seems to me that that would be the case even in, prof in a professional sleep study. You know, if you take a, a real sleep study with PSG equipment and all of that, and, uh, the accuracy in between two different people that are scoring it, or even the same person who scores it once, then waits a couple of weeks and tries it again, is only like 85%. And that's not because there's much confusion over what delta waves are, or what slow wave sleep is. It's mostly these rules. Like one person might think, ah, I kind of see alpha here. And the other person might think, no, that's theta, or that's something else. And based on that, you know, they score differently. So there's so much uh, uncertainty there that, you know, the system doesn't really appeal to me. But I'm teaching you both. You know, if you want to go with AASM method, then you need a major body movement that is more than half of the epoch of the EEG becoming completely messed up. And then you need to be able to see alpha waves. Instead, if you want to go with my method, if you like to see your movements on the hypnogram, 
then whenever you see a big green mess, just push W and score that is wake. And it's kind of up to you how big you want that uh, green mess to be. Like this one is really minimal. It's not much movement at all. But like if I go here, I'm expecting a big green storm here. Yeah, look at this one. This might actually be something that a sleep technician considers a major body movement. And yeah, you could say that this is alpha. See, you don't really know on just one epoch. The reason the spectrogram is so useful is because it takes a bunch of epochs, puts them together, and when you take a bunch of epochs, yeah, the signal, whatever, whatever brain waves you're, you're emitting, they create a nicely behaved, stable frequency pattern. But on one epoch, much harder to see. Now, this might actually be an exception because as I'm looking at the spectrogram and telling you these things, I realize that, look, look at this. There's a kind of a... Uh, there's a kind of like a, let me take the cursor out of the way, but if this is spindles, this thing is actually higher. See that? So this thing might actually be wake right here. So that's one of the occasions in which you might want to go into the signal and look further. Like if you, if you just want to do like a basic sleep scoring and just want to look at the hypnogram, you know, feel free. Uh, if you want to go into a little bit more detail, you could try to figure out what this is because this looks like potentially could be alpha waves. You might remember in the previous episode that there's no necessity that the alpha wake, that, uh, sorry, alpha wake, that the alpha activity emitted prior to going to sleep, and in this case, uh, after waking up, that it should be exactly the same as uh, alpha waves emitted um, during arousal throughout the night. And in fact, when you have a double peak at the beginning of the recording, often you don't have a double peak. If, even if you're emitting alpha within, you know, let's say, the, the, the center of the recording. It doesn't make much of a difference. How many epochs would that be? 661 to 673. So let's say it's like 12 epochs, that's six minutes of sleep. So you're getting into a lot of trouble for six minutes of sleep. If you're really concerned about it, you can go into detail and see what's going on. So you follow the signal from a portion that you recognize. That's N2, or anyway, slow with sleep for sure. So we see the spindles here, and then we see what's going on. Moving forward, okay, so this is a major body movement. Now the question is, do you have alpha? See, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. But if I look at the spectrogram, yeah, that kind of does look like alpha. See, but you can only see it because there's several epochs of it. If you had a major body movement, you kind of don't know if this is alpha and then you go back into n2 then that's it you'd be you know you wouldn't know but in this case it seems like there is alpha and it's going on for a while after that look at here here it's very clear supposing that that's not theta yeah so it's confused i don't even know if that's alpha or theta it seems like both look at the spectrogram i don't know there's a lot of uncertainty that's why i try to keep things simple unless it really does affect the result so I would say that this is wake, 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 just because I'm seeing some uh, clue of alpha waves, both in the spectrogram and below. And then I have another movement right here. And then I lose it. Then I don't see any alpha anymore. So perhaps at this point is... So, so perhaps these epochs should be scored as, uh, as N1 because you had an arousal and then uh, there was alpha waves confirmed and then they disappear. And when that happens, you should score N1. The only, only reason I went into this right now is because I had to talk to you about N1 right here for the sleep onset. And so it seems pertinent to point you to N1 again. Now these decisions, when you don't have a lot of evidence, like you don't have a big eye movements, you don't have big rolling eye movements, you don't have huge, you don't have, you don't seem to have spindles here because the frequency is different. They really depend a lot on the score. So if a sleep technician watches this and they say, and you know, the, the reaction is, what the hell are you saying? That's for sure it's not N1. You know, okay, fine. Maybe it's not N1, but it looks like N1 to me. Uh, let's not go on a tangent here. Today's video was about finding the sleep onset. We've done just that and then I went into some detail about uh, body movements, major body movements, the differences between AASM and uh, my method, which is, you know, it's kind of ridiculous. I don't know why I have a method. 
But that's just because I'm using this device and I'm using this setup. So I want to see my hypnogram and I want to see exactly where I woke up. Like if I'm, if I'm going to move around, my sleep is very easily disturbed, right? If I'm going to move around for like 15 seconds, I'm considering that wake. You know, at least I know I'm not, I'm not sleeping very deeply at that point. How about we open a different recording and look at another person's um, sleep so that we can try to do an exercise and this time you find the uh, sleep onset. Well, hold on because we have a hypnogram here. Don't look. Okay, you look now. I had already scored this. Oh boy. I don't know if I want to get into this one. This is really strange. This is really strange. And this is what happens when you look at people's sleep. Let's not do this one. <laughs> Otherwise, I have to explain for a while. Very rare phenotype. Let's try this one. Uh, you might want to close your eyes because I probably have to erase the hypnogram again. Reset hypnogram. Okay, so how about you find the sleep onset on this one? This is a little bit of a variation, but not a dramatic one, so you might be able to guess. I'll give you a few seconds. Remember, first find the sleep spindles, then look at the beginning of the recording, find whatever activity looks very different, but it's sort of in the same ballpark, but a little bit higher, which means lower frequency, and then find the gap. Okay, are you ready? Um, the first thing you might see from here is that we have alpha waves and we have spindles. Spindles are higher frequency and therefore lower on the spectrogram. Otherwise, you know, this person is emitting so much alpha throughout the sleep that if you don't know the spindles occur at higher frequency, you might not realize which ones are alpha and which ones are spindles. But spindles are higher frequencies and lower in the spectrogram, so you know that this is alpha, that's spindles. Um, you can also see some beta activity. Uh, we've seen beta activity uh, corresponding with uh, alpha activity, I think, in the previous video. And um, so the question is, where's the sleep onset? First of all, this seems like a noisy recording. There's a lot of activity uh, in all frequencies, really. So you won't find that big, nice, blue, deep blue gap you kind of have to look at where one frequency band turns into another. And then you might have two candidates. One is here and one is here. And that's depending on whether you can see some kind of activity of this type right here. Because this is kind of not very localized. It's not very clear. So I think your task in determining the real sleep onset is to figure out whether this guy here is spindles. If it is, then what's happening here? Wake, slow wave sleep. And the person wakes up again. We haven't seen this before, where there's this fragmented sleep. The person is not able to just stay in, in a slow wave sleep. They wake up, wait a bit more, and then finally they get the first nice sleep cycle. So, to verify whether this activity here is spindles or not, first I move into guaranteed spindles. I kind of take a look at what they look like, but that's already N3. Let me see. Okay, here. So, very strong spindle activity. So does this thing occur in this blob as well, yes or no? Move around the epochs. I guess so, look at that. There are indeed sleep spindles. This tells me that the sleep answer should be right around here. And if you hadn't seen this spot, then you would say that it's here. Now that you know where the spindles, hence the slow wave sleep is beginning, you, you retrocede towards what you know to be alpha. And by the way, let's take a look so we know it's alpha. Look at that, barbed wire, the whole epoch. As I told you, uh, sleep spindles are bursts, burst, burst, burst. Alpha waves are continuous, continuous, see? So we know that this is spindles for sure, we know this is alpha for sure. We've got to find the spot in between where one turns into the other. So I put it in the spindle blob and retrocede an epoch at a time and try to see some differences. Not easy. 
not easy, but I see that here, I don't know what happened here. This is, uh, I guess, an electrode coming off. I'm seeing some very faint rolling eye movements. Look at this. Rolling eye movements. And then I also see that the alpha activity here, bright yellow, very strong. Whereas here, it's kind of much more subdued, right? And... Um, so I think that a sleep technician would put sleep onset anywhere between this epoch and this epoch. And I think that they would most likely stay around here. And the reason for that is the following. We have alpha, but it's getting less and less powerful. At the same time, we have rolling eye movements. And then you start to see these K complexes. We saw these uh, in the last episode. These K-complexes are just as indicative of N2 as, as sleep spindles. And we start to see one here and one here. So let's, let's make sense of all this, right? Let's recap. We saw a bunch of recordings in the previous videos and in this video where you have a very nice and clear gap in between alpha activity and spindle activity. And when you do, then you don't even need, need to look at the signal. You just score that gap as N1 anything that comes before is wake, anything that comes after is slow wave sleep, and that was very easy. In this case, we have several difficulties. First of all, the person fell asleep, then woke up again, then fell asleep again. We haven't seen this before. Uh, secondly, the first time that they fall asleep, the activity of the spindle is very confused. It seems like the frequency is not very localized. Localized here makes a thin ridge, not very localized here. And this is just the person's brain. If you look at other places throughout the night, like look here, that's spindles too, but do you see a nice clean ridge? No. So we had to go in and verify that that was really spindles and it checked out. Then we moved back to verify that this was indeed alpha and that checked out. And so our only remaining task was to move between this guaranteed N2 epoch and this guaranteed wake epoch and find out where our best guess is for where to put the threshold. Now I want to make a small comment here, just in case you're thinking, well, this is a mess. This is not as easy uh, as you were saying in the beginning. Well, listen, the, get a feeling for the proportions. This epoch is 110 and this epoch right here is 99. The difference is five minutes. If you just looked at the spectrogram and said, yeah, I kind of see that they begin right here. You're not more than five minutes wrong. And even if you put the onset right here and ignore the blob completely. You're not that wrong. Okay, the onset now has changed a little bit, but how much slow wave sleep did you really have here? Almost nothing, right? So when you look at the report later, it's just gonna be an error by, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes plus. What are you really trying to understand from the report, right? It's telling you how much slow wave sleep you had. And frankly, if this is what your sleep is looking like, don't expect your body to have regenerated substantially right here. If you look at the big picture, what happened is that you didn't really start sleeping solidly until this point. So, you know, you could make a case that even though following the rules to the letter, the sleep onset is around here or here. But see, if this was my sleep, I would not see this point. I would want to know this point. That's why it's so important to be able to take a look at your sleep and be able to look at the actual data, the raw data, and not just read on a report that you fell asleep at, because that wouldn't be telling you this. I mean, these are statistics that are incorporated in other indicators that are going to be on the report, but you know. Ooh, okay, well, that was, uh, that was challenging. That's because I'm opening random data. I'm not picking the easiest ones and uh, try to make it look easy. I'm opening actual data from very different people. And every single person has a different kind of pattern, different kind of activity. And uh, you do need that. Otherwise, you use ZMAX and you open your own sleep and you're like, oh, wait a second here. It looks very different. But here we have a person who has very, very strong alpha activity correlated with uh, creativity. They also have beta activity prior to sleep onset, like one of the persons we've seen. They also have beta activity during REM as well, like I do. So in this case, they have both. So here, here's my take home message, uh, other than uh, being able to find the sleep onset. When you read on the internet that people have beta waves corresponding to this, or beta waves corresponding to that, or alpha waves corresponding to this, 
just realize that we've just seen, and we've only done three lessons, but we've seen a person, me, that has only beta during REM sleep. We've seen one or two people that have beta prior to the sleep onset, and we've seen one that has beta during both. So when there's so much variability, it's like they better write on these internet pages. We don't know what beta is, when it occurs, and uh, just don't look at it <laughs> because you don't need it to score sleep. So just don't look at it and you'll, you'll do good. I just want to make sure this is really RAM and I'm, I'm not lying, okay? Because I just told you this is RAM. These are K-complexes. These are probably up-down eye movements, but they could also be due to an electrode trying to come off or some other stuff. These seems to be left-right eye movements, so yes, we are in REM. But then we're in N2 again, and then we are in REM again. Here, if I can just be allowed the last quick rant before I finish this up. It is said that K-complexes occur <coughs> during N2 sleep, and that rapid eye movements occur during REM sleep, and yet, in this epoch, you've got both. So, and right the next epoch, we've got rolling eye movements. My take on message from a lot of this stuff, and you know, I've seen tons of recordings, is that the brain is not a signal generator. It's not like a signal coming out of a wire from your iPhone. It's doing really complex stuff. We don't really know what all of this stuff is. We know a little bit, but not much. And uh, the idea that the whole brain is doing the same thing all the time doesn't also make that much sense. There's probably some kind of coherence going on. Different brain areas are probably trying to get synchronized to do the same thing, but they're not guaranteed to be doing the exact same thing all the time. So it's perfectly plausible to find some indication of one type of activity in one epoch and some other indication of some other type of activity in the same epoch. And what happens there? Well, if you do a sleep study in a hospital, you never get to see the data because you're the patient and so you don't know based on what criteria the decision was made. Um, and generally you don't even care that much. But uh, it's actually interesting. This is a person with very strong alphas. They keep waking up throughout the night. Here they woke up again. Here they woke up again. Strong alpha. Strong alpha. So the take home message if you, if you look at something like this and you're the patient is you didn't sleep very well. You were awake for 159, 80 minutes before you actually fell asleep solidly. Then you woke up here, you woke up here, you woke up for this whole stretch. I don't know about here, but here for sure. And here for sure. And then here you woke up. And then you woke up here. So you didn't sleep very much and it wasn't very deep. Uh, you probably need to figure out why. Was it too much coffee? Try different things. And then record again and see what can change. If this person wakes up and they don't feel very well, they don't feel very rested, but they tell you, well, you know, I don't know. I don't remember. I was just sleeping. Seems like I've slept a lot. Uh, then looking at the EEG, even just looking at the spectrogram, you would know why. And that's the beauty of having a, a tool that allows you to do that. Okay, I apologize if this has been too hard, but I was really opening random recordings. And uh, I think that's the way I want to do it. I don't want to pretend like this is easy. I want to be able to just open different kinds of people. So you get exposure to the actual sleep of different people. And you might be one of the people that have really regular and unproblematic uh, phenotypes where you just see a little bit of alpha here, nice gap, deep blue, and then the spindles begin. And, and then on the other hand, you might not. So let's review for a second, because I've confused myself now talking so much. Let's review what we've learned in this um, episode. We've learned how to find the sleep onset, just roughly looking at the spectrogram for easy cases. We've seen a couple of cases where it's a little bit less easy, but we were able to anyway either find a couple of options just looking at the spectrogram or as a bonus going to the signal and probe in detail as to what was going on. And uh, based on that, I think we were able to find the exact position where a trained sleep scorer would put the sleep onset. We were able to also and we will, throughout the lessons, each and every time we'll see different phenotypes. Here we saw a different phenotype of somebody who's got beta waves both prior to onset and during REM sleep. 
And we also serendipitously found an example of somebody who had very poor sleep and they were awake for most of it. Now you gotta give it to this guy because usually if you wake up in the middle of the night and stay awake for half an hour, you're gonna move around a lot. This person seems like they were really well behaved, they tried hard to go back to sleep, they weren't moving at all. They're just producing uh, alpha waves like a demon here <laughs> without moving. All right, I hope that wasn't too confusing, but do leave some uh, comments below as I'm recording these. I might, if you, if you want them shorter or easier or want even more depth or have any questions as you look at this, uh, do let me know. Like a question that I would have immediately is, uh, you know, Kurt, you're saying that uh, this is alpha activity and it's bright yellow, but what about this? Because there seems to be a big difference between this yellow activity right here and this less localized, less intense activity right here. What is this? Is this REM? Is this wake? If it's wake, why did the uh, alpha activity happen? If, it, if it's REM, why was there alpha activity? And if it's wake, why is it so weak? And uh, if you want the answer to that, what's happening here is that it's not always the case that alpha activity occurs only during wake. In some people, alpha activity occurs all the time, but it's weaker and it's less localized. So it's possible that it has a different cause, okay? There's also the fact that this person has alpha activity that seems to be quite low in frequency. And so what I'm suspecting here is that there's theta mixed into that as well. We can see that easily if you look at this part of the sleep, for example, there's sleep spindles, and then there's something else on top. See, it's almost like a double peak. So this is probably theta mixed with spindles. Now, if you know that this theta activity is quite high in frequency, and alpha happens to be quite low, they're actually sort of overlapped. And so by looking at the intensity, in this case, you can see where is alpha and where is theta. If they didn't even have an intensity differential, this would be a very problematic record in which you really can't tell where alpha is and where theta is. And if that were the case, then you would probably not see alpha at all. You would judge it all as theta and you wouldn't know if the person was asleep or awake, especially in this uh, period, like you might know right here because there's a lot of movement, but in subsequent epochs, if there was further confusion as to the intensity of these two activities type, then uh, you just wouldn't know that the person is awake. And, you know, when you're dealing with so many different permutations, you just really need to make the best of what you have. Anything that indicates a state change, like going from, yeah, this kind of cloud activity, but it's very weak, to now it's bright yellow. See, it happens very quickly. That's, that's a state change for sure. So you have to determine what does that represent. And my best guess was that, especially since it's introduced by body movement, that that's alpha and therefore wake coming in. But again, this is a very confusing recording. And uh, there's just a no way for me to make it seem like sleep scoring is completely trivial. It's not completely trivial. There are a lot of people for whom it's gonna be completely trivial. If you happen to have a phenotype like this, you know, the good thing is that if you get a recording like this and you're sort of confused, you're actually learning something about what your brain is doing. You know, don't hesitate to just send us your uh, record and I will take a look at it and, and tell you what I think is going on. And by the way, the, the ZMAX data files are the same type of data files that uh, sleep researchers are used to using. So, you know, you can send it to a doctor, you can send it to a hospital. Uh, you know, sometimes you have to pay a little bit of money, but there are some people that are, that are doing analysis and scoring. So you could potentially send it to them or send it to me. I'll do it for free <laughs> for now. And, uh, and I'll tell you what's going on. And then it's just always going to be the same pattern, you see. Every time you go to sleep, you're going to see the same pattern. If, if you're this guy that's got, you know, theta activity kind of overlap with the alpha activity, presuming that's actually what's going on, but simply the alpha activity is much stronger, then that's the pattern you're going to see every single day of your life whenever you record your sleep. And so once you know it, uh, then you know it. This might have confused you to death. <laughs> I hope it didn't. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.